a kind of hard-nosed hope. I first learned about that kind of hope by watching how my mom responded to my dad's diagnosis. It wasn't so much how she cared for my dad, it was how she lived with my dad. Her approach to Parkinson's was emblematic of her approach to life. No nonsense, but full of love. You get up in the morning and you do what needs to be done for the good of your family and the good of society. And after my dad's diagnosis, they just kept doing things. Come on, Bill, she'd sometimes say, we've got to get going. And do things they did. Visiting friends and family, attending movies, concerts, and countless college sporting events. They were huge fans. They would have fit in in Gainesville. But of course, staying in motion and staying hopeful gets tougher over time because Parkinson's is really a disease of subtraction. As everyone here knows, it takes things from you one by one. A hand becomes less steady, a step becomes a shuffle. At time, of course, it can even take away the ability to smile, to talk or think clearly. And what my mom first taught me is that if you're going to contend with the disease of subtraction, you sure better keep adding things to your life. You better believe in the power of addition. You better believe that the plus sign is more powerful than the minus. My mom may have been all business, but her business was us, my dad, her family, her community. Now, it wouldn't surprise me at this point that a few of you, or maybe more than a few of you, might be thinking, well, fine, Dave, but isn't it kind of easy for you to be talking about hope and being positive when I look up there and I see you and you kind of don't necessarily look like someone or sound like someone who has Parkinson's at all? And you'd be right. It is, I think, easier for me. My own progression has been slow. I've been incredibly fortunate. And while, yeah, I've been obsessive about exercise, I really think my Parkinson's experience is mostly just good luck, good fortune. We all know that Parkinson's can be incredibly varied. My late brother and my late dad were far less lucky than I. I think I'm just someone who drew the right card. So yeah, it is easier, I think, for me to be hopeful. But what I want to say is that really all the people I know who are doing the best with Parkinson's or doing the best caring for someone with Parkinson's are those who are able to sustain hope. And when I say doing the best, I'm really not talking about how someone's doing physically. I'm including people who face really serious challenges. But somehow they, as well as their partners, manage to stay oriented towards hope. They're the ones who always manage to see, an, see a glimmer of life's possibilities. The author Barbara Kingsolver once wrote that hope is best thought of as a mode of resistance. I really like that phrase, hope as a mode of resistance, because I think that means that the best way to think about hope is that it's a way for us to push back against Parkinson's and the other diseases of aging. Now, of course, being oriented towards hope doesn't mean that you're immune from feeling down or exhausted or worn out. None of us are. Even Michael J. Fox, the most famously hopeful person of all living with Parkinson's, experiences that. He likes to tell the story about how he was seeing a therapist about his Parkinson's in the early years of his time with the disease. And he talked to the therapist about his 
constant dread about what was going to happen next when the other shoe was going to fall. And he said that finally the therapist looked at him and said, Michael, you have Parkinson's. The shoe already fell. Only then, Fox says, was he able to say, I have Parkinson's. It's a fact. Now what? And for Fox, of course, that now what question led him to starting a foundation that has made an enormous difference in the lives of people living with Parkinson's. I believe that it was his act of hope, his act of resistance. But more broadly, I think asking that question, saying, I have Parkinson's, it's a fact, now what? is a really good question for all of us to ask. And it's a really good question for care partners to ask too. I'm caring for someone with Parkinson's or with dementia. It's a fact. Now what? Because when we ask the now what question, we kind of have to answer it. It's a question that can turn hope into something that's catalytic. It could turn hope into a mode of resistance against the diseases of aging. Asking and answering the now what question focuses, focuses us more on what we can do rather than what we can't. And when we take that approach as a community, like the community that's here today, then I believe the power of hope becomes exponential. I don't think there's ever been a time, at least in my lifetime, when actually being part of a community mattered more. These days in our country, we are so divided that the words American community almost seem like an oxymoron. But to reframe the famous words of Barack Obama, when it comes to aging, there are no blue states or red states. There's only the United States. We're going to age together. And that means we need community. Whether that's your Dance for PD group, your Rocksteady boxing group, a caregiver support group, or a community like the one that's gathered here today. We need each other to make hope sustainable. And I think that means that we need to reach out to each other, especially to those whose lives may be different than our own. We need to harness ourselves to each other because when we do that, when we do that as a community, we turn hope into something with muscle and sinew and bone. And I think we're gonna need every fiber of that toughness whether we're living with Parkinson's or caring for someone with Parkinson's. And it's the subject of caregiving that I'd like to turn to next. As I mentioned before, my mom was my first great example of caregiving. But my dad's last years were difficult, both physically and cognitively. And when my mom could no longer care for him at home, she had to move him to a skilled nursing facility near their home. But she was there every day on her daily mission to make sure that my dad got the best of care. You do not comb his hair like that, she would command. You comb it like this. You do not call him Bill or Sweetie. You call him Professor Iverson. I used to think that as soon as my mom was spotted driving into the nursing home parking lot, that someone probably got on the intercom and said, full staff alert, Adelaide Iverson has arrived. <laughs> After my dad died, my mom continued to live independently in her own home for 13 years. But at the age of 95, she came down with pneumonia and she had a long and difficult hospitalization. And it soon became clear 
that she could no longer live alone. I was a broadcaster and filmmaker living in nearby San Francisco at the time. My life was very full, but it was also flexible. And it didn't take long for me to decide that it just made sense for me to move back in with my mom and help. My mom and I had always been close. We had a kind of easy camaraderie, a certain ease to our relationship. And my partner, Lynn, the woman who would later become my wife, was understanding of the choice I wanted to make. And so, at the sprightly age of 59, I moved back into my childhood home in Menlo Park, California. But there was so much I did not know. I didn't know I'd get so exhausted. I didn't know I'd be capable of getting so frustrated or so angry. I didn't know I'd be tested in ways I'd never imagined or rewarded in ways I'd never dreamed. I didn't know I'd be joined and strengthened by remarkable women caregivers who came in during the day and became my teachers, my comrades, and my kin, who were with my mom until it was time for me to take over at night and on the weekends. I didn't know that the Parkinson's disease I'd been diagnosed with recently would actually present fewer challenges than being a caregiver. And I never imagined that after I moved back in, my mom would live another full decade before passing away at the age of 105. That 10-year caregiving odyssey humbled me, changed me, reoriented me, maybe more than any other experience in my life. When you're a caregiver, as some of you know, you learn something about your strengths, you learn even more about your weaknesses. And I think that's because caregiving is so all-encompassing. You experience love and loss, anger and joy, usually while exhausted and often on the same day. And that was true even though I had it about as good as any family caregiver can have it. And that's because of three little words. I had help. I had these wonderful women caregivers who came in during the day so that I could leave for work. I could walk out the front door in the morning and not come back until evening when it was my turn to take over duties. As many of you know, most caregivers don't get that kind of advantage. Don't get to walk out the front door in the morning and not come back until nightfall. And I was lucky in other ways, too. For starters, my mom and I actually got along, which, by the way, is not something you should necessarily assume about all caregiving situations. My mom and I not only shared the same interests, we shared the same worldview, same political views, but perhaps most importantly, we shared the same team. We were both passionate Stanford University fans. Now, I know that's not the same as being a Florida Gators fan, but it was as good as we could do. Stanford was where my father had spent his teaching career, and I was able to take, keep taking my mom to games until she was past 100. And I learned that there is really absolutely nothing like taking a centenarian to a college football game who is capable of continuing to yell, just tackle him, just get that guy. Yet despite all my advantages, I wasn't ready for what lay ahead. Over time, of course, my mom declined, both physically and cognitively. And as the demands of caregiving increased, as they always do, my level of exhaustion increased too. Caregiving is intensely physical, as you know, which means it's also 
kind of oddly intimate. You learn how to transfer someone from bed to commode and back again, to cleanse someone else's skin, brush their hair the right way, or spoon feed someone who can no longer feed themselves. And I think as adults, we're almost entirely unprepared for that reality. Sure, if, if you're a parent, you might have experienced something similar with a newborn. And yes, I think there are striking similarities sometimes between caring for someone who's very young and someone who's very old. But those similarities also illustrate the profound differences between those kinds of care providing. Changing your baby's diaper, no big deal. Changing your mom's diaper or your spouse's, not exactly the same experience. And of course, the wearier I got as my mom's needs increased, the more some of my shortcomings were exposed. So I want to tell you about one of my greatest weaknesses, which is that I'm someone who likes to be right. And not only that, I like explaining to you why I'm right. But when you're caring for someone with progressive dementia, being right, of course, is an entirely useless attribute. I should have realized sooner than I did that the phrase, Mom, don't you remember, is one of the least useful phrases in the English language. Being a good caregiver for someone with dementia is about comprehension, not correction. It's about trying to understand the truth beneath someone's sometimes confusing words. But I was slow to appreciate the reality of my mom's experience, to really ap appreciate her truth. I just sometimes react more out of confusion or exhaustion or anger. Here's an example. One evening, about two years into my caregiving tenure, I took my mom to a family gathering that my Aunt Alice was hosting. Hosting family gatherings was a role my mom had always loved, but it was a role she could no longer play. When we arrived at my aunt's house, my mom was crabby and snappish, and I wasn't feeling so charitable either. Finally, I walked over to her and said, exactly as I would have to a four-year-old, if you can't act better, we're going home. A few minutes later, we headed for the table, dinner table. I didn't know that you could stalk across the room while using a walker, <laughs> but my mom did. My aunt asked her where she wanted to sit, and my mom snapped at her again. That's it, I said, we're going home. I steered her out of the room, out the door, into the driveway, into the car, and we drove home in absolute silence. When we got back to the house, I ushered her into her bedroom, and she stood next to her bed for a long moment, just gripping her walker. And then she collapsed onto the bedspread and said, I hate myself. And here's the thing, I didn't say a word. I didn't feel anything other than a cold sense of satisfaction. But what did I miss? What did I miss? Well, I don't think I took in what my mom was saying. I really hadn't taken in her truth. I think when she said she hated herself, she meant exactly that. She hated who she was becoming, hated the sense that she was increasingly trapped in a world where she could no longer be who she'd always been, including the person who'd always hosted family occasions. My mom's wail was from the heart. 
but sometimes I felt like my own was turning cold. I remember another time when I blew up at my mom for reasons I cannot even remember, and she started crying. And do you know what I said? I said, go ahead and cry. And then I remember I stalked out of the room, slammed the door like a teenager, and went and stood alone in the garage. And it was raining. And I remember the sound of the rain falling on the roof. And I remember just standing there and feeling like, what is, what is going on? <laughs> What's happening? What's happening to me? And then I remember taking a deep breath and walking back into the kitchen and sitting down besides my mom. And then I was the one who burst into tears. And you know what she did? She reached out and just said, don't cry, David, don't cry. So this is caregiving, right? You get all of it. You get the Stanford games, but you also get the tears. Tears of anger, and if you're lucky, as I was, tears of forgiveness, too. You get all of it, and sometimes you get all of it on the same day. So where do we go to find the continuing strength to answer this question? I have Parkinson's, it's a fact, now what? Or I care for someone with Parkinson's or with dementia, it's a fact, now what? And I think the answer to the now what question means putting writer Barbara Kingsolver's phrase into practice. We need to draw upon hope as a mode of resistance. And those acts of resistance can be large or small. It can be as small and mighty as a person with Parkinson's and their care partner taking a dance for PD class. Because as one participant in one of those classes once said to me, when the dance class is going on, there are no patients. There are only dancers. That's an act of resistance. That's hope. The same applies to how we need to improve caregiving options in this country. We have to say that it's unacceptable not to provide better options, especially for low-income Americans. We have to make sure we remember those who are isolated whether they're isolated because they're care providers or isolated because they're living alone with Parkinson's, means calling those people up and not saying the phrase we've all said hundreds of times, let me know if you need some help. It means instead, I think, saying, I'm going to the grocery store. Can I bring you one carton of milk or two? Or it means, I know you're going to be watching that big Florida Clemson game this Saturday. How'd you like me to come over and watch with you? Or it means, I'd like to come over and, and sit with Frank so that you can just go for a long walk. Small stuff, sure. But isn't that what loving our neighbor is supposed to mean? Small, but mighty. And here's something else we can do. We can do a better job of supporting professional care providers, like the extraordinary women who help me. So I want to tell you their names. Mele Toffa, Eileen Khan, Sinai Latu, Ronette Morales. Those are the names of the remarkable women who joined me for most of that decade. When I fell flat on my face, they lifted me up. When I struggled, they just admired me for trying. They're the ones whose sturdy, sustaining help 
sustain me. They taught me that caregiving is at its essence a physical act of love that must be renewed every day. And those remarkable women, all immigrant Americans, all women of color, all women for whom English was a second or third language, gave me an extraordinary gift. They were there when I needed them. But right now in the United States, we do not value those skills enough. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the average salary for a home care provider last year was under $30,000 a year. So now what? Well, we have to push for change. We have to support each other. We have to join together hope as a mode of resistance. A friend of mine once said to me, who had cared for his wife for many years, he said, we're all carried in life. Sometimes we're carried by others. Sometimes we do the carrying. And it's when we carry each other that we become a true community. And honestly, I can't think of anything our country needs more than that. I'm going to conclude by just reading to you a short passage from my caregiving memoir, which is called Winter Stars, An Elderly Mother, An Aging Son, and Life's Final Journey. It's about carrying and being carried. And it took place during the last Christmas that I spent with my mom. She was 104 and a half. And during that final year of her life, her dementia was advanced. She was often confused and restless. I often worried that she would never find peace. But this night turned out to be different from winter stars. When I walked into my mom's bedroom, I knew right away that on this December night, she was in a different place. There wasn't any restlessness. She just seemed quiet and calm. She looked to be remarkably at peace. We just sat there for a long time, holding hands, and I felt a wave of tenderness come over me. And after a while, my mom turned in her hospital bed and looked at me and said in a voice that was soft, but only slightly slurred, and she said, you look wonderful. And I said that she did too. And I said, you look wonderful, mom. And then she responded by saying, we're a good pair. We just sat for a while, my hand on top of hers, just sitting, nothing more. And then she turned towards me and said, I feel lucky. And she said it with more clarity than anything she had said in recent months. And I told her that I felt lucky too. Lucky for all that she had given to me in my life and to the lives of those around her and that I would always remember what she'd given me. And then she said it again. I feel lucky. And so I asked her if she could tell me why. And there was a long pause. And then she looked at me with eyes as bright as winter stars and said, because there's love all around. On that Christmas night, I felt something I hadn't experienced before, that while my time with my mom was still unfinished, our journey was now complete. 
We'd endured our bursts of anger and frustration. And over time, our deep and abiding connection had always held. We'd found a steadying. And while the currents of time and age had taken us into territory we had never imagined, we'd kept traveling. And that journey had carried us to our truest destination as mother and son. It had brought me to the bedside of someone I loved so that I could hear the deepest of all truths, that there is love all around. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.